Hello, everyone. Today, we're happy to have Professor Daniel Fox from Polytechnic University of Madrid uh, giving his um, first lecture on um, symmetric triangle, trilinear forms and Einstein like equations from affine spheres to Greece algebras. Please, Dan, the screen is yours. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Omid, for inviting me to give a talk here. And well, three talks, I guess. And uh, just a comment that please uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions. I, I'm, I'm using for the first time something that Omid showed me that allows me to write directly on the, on the slides if I need to. And uh, I can add pages. So if there are questions, that's probably the easiest way to deal with it. And um, so let me, get, let me go ahead and get started. So uh, I, I will try today. The idea is really to give, to spend, spend the first half of the talk trying to give an idea of what in the world I'm talking about uh, in all three of the talks. And, and then the second part of the talk, I actually really start speaking in more detail and, and then continue obviously in the next two. Uh, I, I'm not ever been very good at summarizing in, in three phrases what I wanna talk about, but roughly speaking, I want to describe some class of geometric structures and some class of what equations that I want to call Einstein equations for these structures. That and these structures are somehow motivated by 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 the differential geometry of, of hypersurfaces in affine space, and uh, somehow the the underlying subtext is is somehow the one has a metric and one has a symmetric trilinear form, and and how how those interact, and and so I will talk about uh, these things in a variety of different contexts. And, and to start with, I wanna give, I, I will, yeah. So, so that's, that's the basic plan. And, and although there's this number 109 down here, I don't intend to give 109 slides today. Um, and, and in fact, there's a fair amount of redundancy in some of these. So it, some of them are repeated for, for the second and third book and so forth. So don't be too, too frightened. So I'm going to start by uh, recalling briefly um, just some some background because uh, just to, to so that when I speak about things like projective structures and conformal structures, it's clear to everybody what I mean. I think probably to this audience, which knows a lot about parabolic geometries, these things are very well known, and so I, I've only put very brief details. But but so I'm I'll, let me just before explaining in more detail what the talk is about, let me quickly fix some terminology and, and language. So conformal structures and equivalence class of metrics where, where one is a multiple of the other by a non-zero function. And I, I would call a manifold conformally flat if there are charts in which you can represent the conformal structure by a flat metric. And it's known that that's characterized in terms of the vanishing of certain tensors. Um, and the pattern here is, is the same as it will be when I talk about projective structures. So you have a, what gets called a Schutten tensor, which is a, a, a modification of the Ricci tensor. Uh, you can modify it by a multiple of the metric. This multiple S is the scalar curvature. And, and you, you take a trace-free part of the curvature tensor, which, and you call it the conformal wild tensor. So this is the, the part of the curvature tensor. That, this is the curvature tensor of the of the of the Levy-GV connection of the metric. And, and this is the part which is completely trace-free. And here the square brackets indicate complete symmetrization over the enclosed indices. I'm using the standard abstract index notations, which I, I use whenever they're helpful to make things compact and fit on slides. And, and then one has what's called the conformal cotton tensor, which is the, the anti-symmetrized covariant derivative, uh, the covariant derivative of the Schotten tensor anti-symmetrized in the first two indices. And this P and this P should actually be the same ones. So this one should be a node script. Um, and, and one has, of course, the, the trace differential Bianchi identity tells one that the divergence of the conformal wild tensor is a multiple of the conformal cotton tensor. And the multiple is, is up to constant factor is n minus three. And so that's relevant in what follows. The characterization of conformally flat manifolds is simply the vanishing of the conformal wild tensor if n is at least three. And it's the vanishing of the conformal cotton tensor if n is three. In, in higher dimensions, the vanishing of the vial tensor implies the vanishing of the formal cotton tensor because the divergence of the vial tensor is n minus three times some constant times the cotton tensor. And in, in two dimensions, all metrics are conformally flat. And so this all is probably well known. 
And I will at some point, and maybe not today much, but in, in the second talk, talk about vial structures. Vial structure is a generalization of a conformal structure where we, we consider there's a conformal structure together with a, a torsion free affine connection, which has the property that it, it preserves the conformal structure in the sense that for each representative metric, the covariant derivative is, is a, a tensor product of some one form with the, with the metric. So this again, and, and, and for, for such structures, there are, are similar tensors and, 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 and basically the same stories hold. And I'll, I'll review this at some point at the beginning of the, at some point during my second talk, but to where it will become relevant directly. Projective structures are, are another class of, of, so I guess maybe one other comment here is that, of course, the way one can prove these things is one can build the conformal normal power down connection associated to the conformal structure and these, these different uh, curvatures appear as, as harmonic curvature components. Although I'm not going to use that formalism today. Right? Projective structures, the story is, is, is essentially the same in a formal sense. Two, two connections, they're, they're here I mean torsion free connections on a tangent bundle are projectively equivalent. Well, if, the, if their difference tensor is, is determined by one form in this way. And what this means in practice is that the images of their geodes of the of their geodesics, their unparameterized geodesics are the same as sets. So the so for instance, the hyperbolic metric and the, and the flat Euclidean metric are projectively equivalent in this sense. So I'll call a projective structure, I mean an, uh, an equivalence class of connections in this sense. And uh, I, again, it's projectively flat if there are locally charts in which the geodesics can be realized as straight lines. And we have exactly the same story as in, in the case of the conformal structures. We have a, a Schoten tensor, which is a, a modification of the Ricci tensor. We have a trace free part of the curvature tensor, which is called the projective vial tensor. And we have a projective cotton tensor, which formally is identical to the projective, the conformal cotton tensor, but defined using the projective Schoten tensor. And Again, the differential Bianchi identity tells you the divergence of the projective vial tensor is a, is a multiple that's n minus two times some constant times this, this projective cotton tensor. And so one obtains the projective flatness is characterized by well, the vanishing of both these tensors if n is bigger than two, the, the vanishing of the cotton tensor following from the vanishing of the vial tensor in that case. And if n is two, simply the vanishing of the projective cotton tensor. The point, it, it, what's special in the n equals three case here and the n equals two case here is that the vial tensor automatically vanishes in these dimensions for, for basic representation theoretic reasons. To say that it takes a value, the, the module of trace-free tensors of the appropriate symmetries is automatically trivial in, in these low dimensions. Okay, so that's just some background that I need on this next slide. So this is to explain a little bit what I'm gonna mean by Einstein, which is something I'm gonna go into more detail today. So we have this classical hierarchy of curvature conditions, which, uh, which is constant sectional curvature, the Einstein equation and constant scalar curvature. I'll explain the notation in just a moment, but the idea I have in mind is that the, the first equation is the, the most restrictive, the strongest. The second is it's somehow it's traced version. And the third is it's traced version. So what's the notation here? The, this is the some variant of the Kolkarni new Mitsu product of the metric tensor with itself, which is simply a curvature tensor. Uh, it has the symmetries of a metric curvature tensor. So it's skew symmetric in I and J, skew symmetric in K and L, and it's skew symmetrization in I, J, and K is zero. So say it satisfies the algebra of Bianchi identity. And uh, here H is any pseudo Riemannian metric. The signature for much of what I say won't matter. And then my conventions for the curvature are probably not yours. Um, and that explains why when I take the Ricci trace, I take it on the last two indices, the outside, outermost two indices. But, um, and that also explains this minus sign here, probably. But at any rate, uh, one has to, of course, modify signs to conform with one's preferred conventions. So the sectional curvature being constant simply says that the Riemann tensor, the, the curvature tensor of the, of the levi civitti connection of the metric is a multiple of this curvature tensor determined by the metric. And uh, the Einstein equation has two different ways. Of, there are two different ways of writing it. Depending, the left is sort of the geometer's way of writing it, and the right is more the physicist's way of writing it. And th this simply says that the, the trace-free part of the Ricci tensor um, vanishes. And the, the physicist thinks more in terms of the Einstein tensor, which is the divergence-free part of the Ricci tensor. So that this tensor, which is Ricci tensor minus half the scalar curvature times the metric is divergence free as a consequence again of the differential Bianchi identity. 
And, and so then the, this equation on the left is equivalent to saying the Einstein tensor is, is some multiple of, of, of the metric. Uh, one tends to interpret this multiple as a sort of cosmological constant. And, and uh, it, again, it's a consequence of the differential Bianchi identities that this Einstein equation applies the constancy of the scalar curvature of this, of this constant here. So when n is two, of course, one has to say that's a special case, but I'm, I, I, I'm gonna avoid that for the moment. And, and so uh, I've cited here the classical Beltrami theorem because it's how I'm gonna think about constant sectional curvature. I wanna think of constant sectional curvature really as, as projective flatness of the Levi-Civita connection of the metric. So what the classical Beltrami theorem says is that a metric has constant sectional curvature if and only if it's projectively flat in the sense that its Levi-Civita connection is projectively flat in the sense of the previous slide. And I mean, in this case, you have a conformally flat Einstein manifold. And, and the converse is true if n is at least two. And so, so all of this is, is probably well known to everybody here, but, but uh, I'm, I'm mentioning it because it, it's, so what I'm, what, what, I, what I'm basically going to talk about is how to define an analogous hierarchy of equations for uh, a, a more general class of geometric structures that I call AH structures, which AH abbreviates affine hypersurface. But the, 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 way to think, the way I'm gonna think about it today is I'm gonna be coupling a metric with a symmetric three tensor. And I wanted to find analogs of this hierarchy for that data. And it's gonna be analogous in the sense that I'm gonna think of, my starting point is gonna be thinking of the Einstein-Maxwell equations here, which, which couple this metric to a two form, which one can think of the electromagnetic two form and replacing that two form by a symmetric three tensor. And what I want to try to do, at least in the first part of this talk, which will probably wind up taking the whole talk, the way I, I do things, is uh, is motivate why this is a reasonable thing to do and, and why it's why it might be interesting. So that's where I'm going to try to go to now is to explain some contexts in which things of this nature arise. And so th this is this, the, the other subtext of the talk besides Einstein equations is is thinking about the linear algebra of, uh, of a vector space equipped with a symmetric bilinear form, which in general is going to be non-degenerate of the metric and an auxiliary symmetric trilinear form. And so here are some geometric contexts for data like that, geometric and algebraic context for data like this occurs naturally. One, which I'll explain in great detail later on is a hypersurface in a flat affine manifold has uh, what's called its flash geometric, which comes from essentially the second fundamental, a, a canonical representative of the second fundamental form and its pick form, which is a cubic form or symmetric trilinear form, which measures the difference tensor between the Levi-Civita connection of the Blasch geometric and, and in a certain induced affine connection. So, and I'll explain this in more detail later on. It, this structure really can be abstracted in, it, it, under what people call statistical structures, um, which are a pair from, consisting of a, of a torsion free affine connection on tangent bundle and, and a metric so that while well, the covariant derivative is, is, is not zero, but it's, it's skew symmetrization and the first two indices vanishes. Equivalently, the covariant derivative is completely symmetric. And uh, this name statistical is not one I particularly like, but it seems to have stuck. And um, yeah, so, so I'll, 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 we'll come back to this. And then a third context where similar data occurs is when you consider Lagrangian submanifolds with Kähler manifolds, para Kähler manifolds, pseudo Kähler manifolds, all, all of these different sorts of things. You get in where you, you want to look at manifolds that for which you actually get an induced metric, so that, that there's some non-degeneracy condition there. And you take the second fundamental form. The second fundamental form is really a two tensor taking values in the normal bundle of the Lagrangian submanifold, but using the the almost complex structure or the almost paracomplex structure or whichever it is, you can twist it and, and, and using the metric, you can lower an index to obtain a uh, symmetric trilinear form on the manifold. So this is, these are three geometric contexts which are actually quite closely related, um, but maybe it's different points of view are what's present here, but the, the data is somehow quite similar. And then there's a, there's a fourth context, which is, will turn out to be useful for constructing examples and also, is surprisingly rich in its own right, which is uh, purely algebraic. And so this is a little bit like the situation where 
the Levy Chavita connection of the metric H up here is constant. I mean, is is uh, is flat, not constant, flat. Uh, and this is we have a, a multiplication on a vector space, which in general is going to be non-unital, non-associative, but is commutative, and it's equipped with a metric, meaning here simply meant simply a constant non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. It's invariant, which just means exactly that this trilinear form cooked up from the multiplication and the metric is symmetric. So you get the same sort of data. And so the, the, the main thing I want to talk about is somehow defining and making sense of Einstein equations in these contexts and why it's reasonable to call the equations I want to define Einstein. So that's where we're headed next. But the, the, the general structure that subsumes all of these preceding structures is, is what I'm going to call a a, this is my terminology, and it's maybe not the best terminology, but I, I, I'm, I'm habituated to using it, so I'm going to inflict it on, on the audience, is AH abbreviates affine hypersurface structure. And, and it's, it's a, apparently a very general class of structures. It's a pair comprising a, a projective structure and a conformal structure, so that for every representative of the projective structure and every representative of the conformal structure, there's a one form so that it's almost a statistical structure with some up to a one form. So the, the and of course, one, so equivalently, the, the completely trace free part of the covering derivative of H is, 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 is completely symmetric. And one can check that this is, these are well-defined conditions if I've written them right. And, and they don't depend either on H or on, or on the choice of, uh, of, it's not, it's a simple exercise to check that this is actually well-defined. And um, so th there's an, th I'll explain later, there's an involutive notion of conjugacy of AH structures, which, which gives you a second AH structure with the same underlying conformal structure, but a different projective structure. And it's involutive in the sense that if you do it twice, you get back where you started, such that the self-conjugate AH structures are exactly the usual vial structures, maybe with the definition written in a slightly unusual way. And another way of thinking about these structures is probably is they're just locally statistical structures. And, and I'll, I'll make that precise uh, in the second talk. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it, in the case that there's a representative metric for which this associated one form gamma is zero, then, then it defines with the associated uh, connection a, a statistical structure. And so somehow you can think of these, and that, that's what I call it the exact case. Uh, you can think of these as, as a generalization of a homophily class of special statistical structures. And uh, the final comment is that when this projective structure is projectively flat, we're essentially talking about a uh, locally Kähler affine structure. A Kähler affine structure would be a flat, would essentially a flat statistical structure where the connection is flat. And what that means, coupled with this condition, it means that the metric can locally be written as the Hessian of a function. And, and so th these are essentially, this is the terminology of Cheng and Yao for what a lot of people call Hessian uh, structures. So, so this is the, the, the general context in which I wanna operate. And I, I need to motivate it, obviously. But let me say first what I mean a little bit by Einstein-like equations. So for, for me, Einstein-like equations are, are going to mean that some Ricci tensor, which is usually con concocted from the Ricci tensor of some connection plus something else, is a multiple of the metric. And the auxiliary tensor from which the Ricci tensor is constructed is generally going to have to satisfy some closed, closed, closed conditions. Um, and so exactly what I have in mind are is, is the Einstein-Maxwell equations here below. We have a metric in a two-form that satisfy the Ricci tensor minus some quadratic expression in the two-form. This, you should think of this as something up the sign. It's like the composition of the, if you think of the two-form, you, you, can, you can equate it with a, an endomorphism by raising one of its indices using the metric. This is up the sign, it's the composition of those endomorphisms. And this is saying that the trace-free part of this difference is, is vanishing. And then you have, the the these are the equations in vacuum that it's a closed two form and it's a co-closed two form and it's the first equation here is absolutely fundamental and the second one can probably can relax some context in some ways but but so the idea is to replace this f by by 
tensors with other kinds of symmetries and, and the appropriate differential and co-differential. And I'll explain this in detail for symmetric tensors. The case of most interest for me is going to be symmetric three tensors. And the idea is to recover some things that, that are in the context that I already mentioned, to re recover some, some known things and maybe some not so known things. So one is that I, I want my Einstein equations for age structures to specialize to the usual Einstein while structures. The, the second is, and is that um, if I have a hypersurface in, in, uh, in flat affine space and it's co-oriented and non-degenerate, it acquires in a, in a canonical way, which I'll explain, a, uh, an AH structure, like in this, but really it acquires in fact a statistical structure. And I, I, want, I want to get an Einstein equation for statistical manifold, but in this context of, 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 of affine hypersurfaces, there's a special distinguished class of affine hypersurfaces called affine spheres. And I will explain what those are, but they're, they're, they're umbilic objects in affine geometry. To say the affine shape operator is an operator of a, is a multiple of the identity, and um, it will turn out that they're exactly the Einstein for, for the induced statistical structure on affine hypersurface. It's going to be Einstein if and only if the hypersurface is an affine sphere. And somehow this observation is what motivates the entire line of development here. And this part about convex flat projective structures, I'll explain later. And in the context of the algebras, um, I, had def I had spoken of an algebra that has an invariant metric on it, where invariant means that this associated trilinear form is, is completely symmetric. Uh, the Einstein condition translates into requiring that that metric be some particular nice metric, in particular, uh, the killing form or what I call the Ricci form, we're here L of X is like add of X in the Lie algebra. This is the operator of multiplication by X. So this is like the killing form of the Lie algebra, except I'm dealing with a commutative algebra. And this is some other similar trace form. So it turns out that it's much stronger to require the invariance of, of one of these metrics than it is to require the invariance of just some random metric. Um, okay, so that's, that's somehow the the, the first glimpse of what I'm trying to talk about, and, and I'm going to now try to make it a bit more concrete. So let's, let's let me just, this is a little bit more notation for when I talk about a general symmetric K form. So, so just what I mean by a K form is just a, a, a I take a K tensor, um, and here this means a vector space in the dual, and this is the K tensor product, symmetric group X on the left, and this. By, by permuting the indices, if you like. And, and so I'm calling it tensor symmetric if it's stable under this action. And in, in abstract index, it's written like this. And by a K form, I mean the associated degree K homogeneous polynomial. And so you can go back at least over a field of characteristic zero, you can go back and forth between K forms and K linear forms via polarization. And this is the usual exclusion, inclusion, exclusion formula for the polarization. And I imagine I've gotten the constant factors right, although one always has to check that. But, but um, and then I will speak about the Kolkarni new Mitsu product of a symmetric tensor with itself. So here A is all the indices that are just being traced over. It's to say here, if, 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 if omega is a K tensor, A is really K minus two indices, and they're being paired with themselves down here. And, and I'm skew symmetrizing over I and J, and I get a tensor of curvature tensor type, and then this is its Ricci tensor, tr its Ricci trace. And then most of what I consider this part will vanish because I will actually restrict attention to trace free symmetric tensors most of the time. So this is just notation. And just this is a little more general than what was previous. Uh, I'm sorry, that did it, it's just a previous formula, not clear what W is over there. The where here W is the last formula in this one. The W should be omega, it should be the same, it should be, but omega. it has different number of indices. And uh, this trace, no, the trace. Oh, so, so this this really abbreviates. Um, 
I don't know, B1, B2, uh, uh, does that make sense? The, the trace, the trace of omega is a K minus, it, the trace mean, I have uh -huh. a metric, I have a metric. Uh -huh. so, so the trace here is with respect to the metric. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. This, this makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, it's bad. It, you, this is, that's another way. I could just put the metric in here. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, because when I raise the index here, I'm, I, there, there, there's somehow, yeah, I, I, I have a metric. Is being used to raise the index yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Any other? Okay. So, so here just, just this is just a comment about the sort of the geometric interpretations. I mean, when 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 H is when when omega is a two tensor symmetric two tensor, uh, we all know the linear algebra of pairs of a metric and a, a, a pairs of two tensors, if you like, symmetric two tensors. We can diagonalize one with respect to the other when one of them is non-degenerate, and and uh, and and we, we all are used to using this observation in the context of of hypersurface geometry in the Riemannian context, where we have the induced metric and the second point all form, which is a symmetric two tensor, and we diagonal, or we can also write it as the the as an endomorphism, uh, which is we call the shape operator, and and when we diagonalize one with respect to the other, and we use this a lot. In the, in the case k equals three, the geometric interpretations are those which I already mentioned. And I don't know good geometric or algebraic interpretations when k is greater than four. Uh, and that's why I put a question mark here because there may be some, but, um, and I would be very interested if someone knew, knew some, is I guess why I'm mentioning this on this slide. It's to say, if anyone knows a good geometric context where, where quartic forms appear, naturally with a metric, uh, it, would, it would be very interesting to, to hear about it. What's special about k equals three, as I already said, is this is that in, it, this really should say trilinear form plus metric um, it, it is equivalent to this context of metrized commutative algebras. And so here, just because I'll use this various times later on, I've, I've written the formulas in a little more clearly. Uh, it's possible that I left out a six here. Um, no, I, I put the six here. The six goes here, it looks like. So, so this is how you go between a, a cubic form and a, and, a, and, a, and a multiplication via polarization. And, and so this is the trilinear form that you get when you have a multiplication and a metric, and you're supposing that this is completely symmetric is equivalent to saying that the metric is invariant, which I say is H metrizes the algebra. Okay, so that's what's special about the k equals three case is this interpretation as an algebra, and this also has an interpretation in terms of a, a connection. So uh, let's suppose we have an algebra and it's got this constant metric and and, and that such that this is completely symmetric, and we we have our left multiplication endomorphism defined by L of x of y is x times y. So this is this is like add for a Lie algebra, and here's its structure tensor. Its structure tensor is just the trilinear form. Omega with, with one of its indices raised. And that means it has the form of the difference tensor of two connections. So we can think of the Levy Vita connection of this metric. This is a metric on a vector space. It's a, it's a constant thing. This is the flat connection. So I'm modifying the flat connection by, by a, a parallel tensor. Okay, this is a parallel tensor. This is a cubic form on a vector space. So this structure tensor is, is, a, is their constants. So, so this is this. This modified connection, however, need not be flat anymore. It satisfies uh, this relationship. And so if I skew an I and J, I get zero. That means that this determines statistical structure. And, uh, but the consequence of, of the, the trilinear form being parallel with respect to levy the connection is the curvature of this new connection I've built is, is purely algebraic. And here I've written it out so that if this is the curvature of this connection, what comes out is that it's essentially given by the commutator of, of these left multiplication endomorphisms. And the commutator of these left multiplication endomorphisms, in the case of a, this Y is a typo. Uh, in the case of a, a commutative algebra, 
this commutator is up to sign just the associator in the in the algebra where the associator is, is the I see why I got the typo. This should be X of Z, this should be Y, and then yeah, this should be Y, is what that should say. No, no, it says what I wanted to say. And so the, this curvature is measuring the non-associativity of the multiplication. And when I take the Ricci type trace of this curvature, I get out this, this form, which is the form I mentioned before here in the context of Einstein like equations. And um, it, I think of it as the Ricci form of the algebra. It's some sort of, it's close to being the killing form, but modified. And, and it's vanishing would be a sort of very weak partial associativity of the algebra. And so I, this is, it's this observation which allows me somehow to go back and forth between, to, to view this kind of algebra as a special case of this kind of differential geometric structure. And uh, so I'll, I'll come back to that later. Okay, which property does this curvature satisfy? Which property, in, in what sense? Which symmetry is like? In general, not nothing. I mean, this is actually, uh, if you don't impose some auxiliary conditions, these algebras can be extremely general. So say a metrized commutative algebra is a very general object. There are a lot of them. Um, if I require that H have some form, so an Einstein-like equation would require that this form here be a multiple of H. And that turns out to be a much more restrictive condition than it appears. It's, not, it's still, there's still a lot of examples. I'll explain some examples uh, a little bit later on, but just to say uh, Euclidean Jordan algebras, for instance, uh, give, give an example. Uh, the tensor products of semi-simple Lie algebras give examples. Uh, the Grice algebras of certain vertex operator algebras give examples. And there are other, mostly that come from combinatorial constructions. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll, I'll make that. I'll try. I'll try to make that clearer in a bit. If that's, but yeah, the this this right here is a very is too general an object. Is perhaps the way to say it. But you, you know, actually, a statistical structure is an obscenely general object. Also, I mean, one <laughs> in the sense that it's it's far more general than a Riemannian metric or an affine connection. All right. It's, it, so these are very general things. So one needs some equations to, to, to say anything meaningful. So uh, okay, I've, I've made this comment, and let, let me let me just quickly summarize uh, the, af the, the 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 affine differential geometry that I have in, in the back of my mind. So I, l l this is a this all can be generalized, but let's think about flat affine space, and I want to think for the moment about a locally convex hypersurface. And in that case, I can define a canonical normal for the hypersurface. It's called the affine normal. And this definition goes back to Blaschka. Uh, you, you're, taking, you're taking your locally convex hypersurface. You take a point P and you take its tangent, its tangent line at P and you translate it. And when you translate it, it, it cuts in a convex domain. And the very centers of, this convex, of these convex domains as I take the parallel transit to the tangent plane cut out a curve. And the, the tangent to this curve at P is the affine normal. The, the, the line I've drawn doesn't look very tangent to the curve, but it's supposed to be. And that definition is, is not very wieldy from an analytic point of view, but conceptually it's quite attractive. It doesn't work well in the non-convex case as far as I know, and you need a different definition in that case. I'll give it later on. But, but this is a, a, a good way to think about things sort of intuitively, and uh, it, it serves to, suffices to, to prove essentially that such a thing exists. So th this gives a canonical direction transverse to the to a locally convex hypersurface. Uh, by locally convex, I really mean um, that the second fundamental form, well, I really mean two things. I mean two-sided, so it's co-oriented, and the, the second fundamental form has definite signature. Um, but but I, I'll, 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 yeah, so, and that's actually needed down here. So that's, when I say co-oriented, I mean, it has two sides. So the Mobius band is not co-oriented. 
And non-degenerate means that the second fundamental form, which I've used a normal bundle value symmetric two tensor, is, is non-degenerate. Um, the co-orientation allows me, so I, by picking different transversals, I can trivialize the second fundamental form and, and identify it with a, a, a genuine symmetric two tensor. And different traces of transversals determine conformal metrics. Well, the orientation is what allows me to really determine a conformal class. Otherwise, I have a change of sign possible. And so just the, the mere fact of having a non-degenerate co-oriented hypersurface gives me a conformal structure on the, on, the, on the surface. And via the affine normal, I get an affine connection. And the Kodazi equations, uh, usual Kodazi equations, give a compatibility between the two of them, which says that my language, they're an AA structure. Actually, it says more. It says essentially that they're an exact age structure. In fact, one can somehow just, well, I won't say more. Basically, one should think that there's an induced statistical structure. To do so, one would actually have to specify an affine normal vector field, not only an affine normal direction. And to do that, normally what one does is one selects a parallel volume form on the, on the flat uh, dimensional, on the ambient affine space. And one, in if you have a if you have a volume form here and and a, and a and a transversal parallel to the affine normal, it induces a volume form on the on the hypersurface. On the other hand, the representative of the second fundamental form that corresponds to your transversal is a metric which determines its own volume, and you, you require that those are equal, and that actually determines a canonical normalization of the of the normal that that allows you to pick out a distinguished metric. And that distinguished metric with the induced affine connection constitutes a statistical structure, in fact. And then you have what's called the conormal Gauss map. And so what this is, is I associate to uh, a point of the hypersurface, the annihilator of its tangent space. So th that actually is a map that goes from the, the hypersurface into the projectivization of the, of the vector space dual to the ambient affine space. And it's in general not is directly related with the second fundamental form as it would be in the Euclidean, in the Riemannian context. Um, but I have here a flat projective structure and I pull it back via the conormal Gauss map and I get a second uh, projective structure on the hypersurface, different from that generated by the convection induced via the affine normal. And it turns out that these two projective structures are conjugate. In the, in the sense of the conjugacy of AH structures I spoke about back here. So, so somehow the, the, the summary is that uh, a non-degenerate oriented hypersurface in flat affine space acquires a pair of conjugate AH structures. Really, in fact, it acquires a pair of conjugate statistical structures, but if, if one wants to add a little extra data, um, one of which is projectively flat. And, the special class of hypersurfaces that, that, that occur in affine geometry are, are affine spheres. So these are the a, these are the umbilic objects in affine geometry. And, and one says that a hypersurface is an affine sphere if its affine normals all meet in a point, which is called center, or all parallel, in which case it's called the center in infinity. And the basic examples are ellipsoids, hyperboloids, and paraboloids. Paraboloids would be the case where the affine normals are all parallel. They're, Ellipsoids would be the case, the, the, the center of an ellipsoid is, is its center as an affine sphere. And a hyperboloid is, well, it's asymptotic to a cone, a hyperboloid of two sheets, the standard, if you think about the standard one like that, it's asymptotic to, uh, to the, the light cone and the vertex of that light cone is the center of, the, of, of it viewed as an affine sphere. So all the affine normals meet in, 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 that, in that point. Um, the, this wouldn't be very interesting if those were all the affine spheres, and they aren't, and I'll comment on the next page how we know that. But uh, the, the, the basic motivating observation of everything I'm going to talk about is that there are Einstein equations for AH structures, so that the conjugate pair of AH structures induced on a co-oriented non-degenerate hypersurface of flat affine space are Einstein if and only if the hypersurface is an affine sphere. And so somehow I, I knew this observation before I knew how to formalize it. And, and a lot of this, what comes is an attempt to understand it better. 
How do we know that there are lots of affine spheres? And this is uh, worth comment now because it's not, not so well known. So in fact, if you have a convex affine sphere and it's flash geometric is complete, uh, there are theorems that, that, so one says it's elliptic if the, if the, how to say it, um, the, if, the, if the center, the center can, it can curve away from the center or it can curve towards the center. Okay, and if it curves towards the center, one calls it elliptic. If it curves away from the center, one calls it hyperbolic. It, this is essentially this measured by the sign of the affine mean curvature, which is the, the, the average of the eigenvalues of the affine shape operator, which I haven't defined. But, but the, and it's a theorem that's in full generality due to Kalabi. That if the if the Blasch geometric is complete and uh, convex affine hyperbolic sphere is elliptic, then then in fact it's it's the uh, it's an ellipsoid, and, and in fact H has to be the essentially the Fubian study metric on, on a sphere. Um, if if uh, and, and then it's a quite a bit harder theorem due to Kalabi, Jorgens Kalabi, and Cheng Yao in full generality, and I should actually add the name Polarov here. Uh, this name should be added. Um, it, that if M is a parabolic affine sphere, parabolic means that the affine normals are parallel in, in, in the convex case. Um, then, then the induced metric, the Blaschke metric is flat and you have an elliptic paraboloid. But the, the deep thing, is, which is due to Chang and Yao and in, in, in all of its essential details, um, is that if you take any pointed convex cone, so anything that looks like this, over you take a cone over any dom any any convex domain. You take any convex domain like this, that's supposed to be convex, it doesn't look very convex. And you take the cone over it. Okay, then you can find a uh, its its interior is foliated by hyperbolic affine spheres that are asymptotic to its boundary and have center at its vertex. So this picture completely generalizes the the usual picture from the Minkowski height cone and the usual hyperboloids. And so this demonstrates that there, this is a difficult theorem. It's, it's a kind of, it's a little bit like a real analog of, of, of Yao's solution of the Kalabi conjecture in the negative Turing class case for Kaler manifolds. And it was proved about the same time. And, and, and actually a lot of the estimates are the same sorts of estimates. And a lot of the fundamental estimates go back to Kalabi. In fact, Kalabi had conjectured that this should be true in a very precise way. So this result is all the conjecture due to Kalabi. I just, I just remarked that the, the conjugacy of AH structures reflects the duality of affine spheres. It's a generalization of the duality of affine spheres that comes from the duality of cones. If I have a cone, I get to have a dual cone in the dual uh, vector space, and there, there are affine spheres asymptotic to each of them, and they're, they're somehow dual, and, and, and they somehow induce uh, conjugate AH structures. It, it, uh, a side comment is that the non-convex case is interesting, and there is no analogous theorem in that context. There are I, I've written some things about providing examples of affine spheres in this context, and Roland Hildebrand is another person who's written quite a bit about that, and there are other people. But um, th there's actually a lot of a lot of work that could be done in this direction. It would be interesting to know more about. But more is known than what I'm saying on this slide, but. There's a lot, nothing of this scope is known in general. Okay, um, you know, I'm gonna skip this slide for the moment and, and just, and just, this will summarize. So my, my initial summary that was supposed to take half the talk has taken already 40 minutes. So this is what always happens, but. Um, so I, I'm gonna explain the Einstein equations for, for age structures that have these following properties. They're preserved by conjugacy, for vial structures, they specialize the usual Einstein vial equations. That for hypersurfaces in, in flat affine space, they are Einstein if and only if the hypersurface is an affine sphere. And actually, an analogous statement in the, in the case of Lagrangian submanifolds of a paler, paler space form, they get an induced AH structure and it's Einstein a, when their uh, mean curvature is zero. This is actually very closely related to the affine hypersurface case. And 
they can be rewritten in such a way that they look just like the Einstein Maxwell equations, but with a trace free symmetric free tensor in place of the electromagnetic tensor. And that's what I want to explain now. Well, no, first, just a, a couple other things. None of this would be interesting if I, if I didn't know examples that were not Einstein Weil and not equivalent to the ones induced on affine spheres. So say, there are other examples. The simplest one, which I'll, I'll explain, is, is defined in SUN. Um, and there's something special about the A series of Lie algebras in this context. So one shouldn't go looking for examples on, on, on orthogonal groups. Um, and that in the algebra, in the purely algebraic context, they specialize to looking for commutative algebras. Exact means that the trace of the left multiplication endomorphisms is always zero. So this is like unimodularity of the Lie algebra. And that the invariant metric is actually given by this killing form. So these examples in general are, are neither vile nor, nor locally equivalent affine spheres. Um, they're, they're also in general not compact, but one has a compact example. And this is all, these examples are, these examples can be built in, in various signatures. The examples here are actually in the Riemannian signature. And here I've listed some of the algebras that occur in this way, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. So there's no reason to go into detail right now. So let me, let me try to, actually say some math today, instead of just introducing what I'm gonna talk about. So here, this repeats the slide I showed you before, just to remind you of the, the hierarchy of curvature equations, constant sectional curvature, Einstein constant scalar curvature, and I wanna think of constant sectional curvature as projectively flat. So let's go to thinking about how, how, how to generalize this. So the Einstein-Maxwell equations, we have an electromagnetic two form, we have this quadratic expression, which is essentially up to sign, it's the composition of the or endomorphisms determined by the metric and the two form. And, and my norms of tensors, I'll write this, whatever the signature. Uh, and I always mean the norm given by complete contraction so rather than the induced norms. So that will mean that the constant factors are different than what most people are used to thinking about, the constant factors like this one. But, and the einstein maxwell equations in vacuum are simply the, the Two form be closed and both closed, and the, the trace free part of this modified Ricci tensor be zero. And, and the way a physicist thinks about this is that you have the uh, stress energy tensor of the electromagnetic two form, which is, is this here. And, and what's the point? This is supposed to be divergence free. And that's where these conditions intervene. So these are necessary, these are something like them is necessary to get that this is trace free. And when we write the Einstein equations in this form, this is the Einstein tensor, the Ricci tensor minus half the scalar curvature times the metric. We want to get that this cosmological constant is constant. And well, that follows immediately if both T and G are, are, are divergence free. And, um, and, 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 and so that, that's, that constancy of this quantity is, is the analog of the constancy of the scalar curvature coupled with, with, with these equations. So the first question is, 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 can we make sense of our constant sectional curvature in this context? Okay. In other words, we, we have this, we have this. Do we have something that goes in up here? And, and yeah, you can write down something. I, I don't know exactly how interesting it is, but here, here I've written it for general p-form. So here, the setup for p-form is exactly like for a two-form, just two changes to p. And, um, here, here I've defined a quadratic expression in the two form, which yields a curvature tensor. Well, this is complicated, but it, it's just a curvature tensor uh, where I'm raising and lowering indices with the auxiliary metric. And, and uh, the point is this has the symmetries of a metric curvature tensor. And it's Ricci trace is, is, is just this quadratic thing. So it, it, it's symmetric to tensor. And the stress energy tensor here, there's an article at Baird where he explores this and, and the, it looks a lot like it did in the, in the, in the P equals two case, the, this changes to a P. And the key point is that you have an identity like this, which relates D of F, D star of F, this is the divergence essentially of F and the divergence of the stress energy tensor. So that if 
you satisfy these two equations, you conclude from this identity that the stress energy tensor is divergence free. And, and the Einstein equations down here are, are, are well formulated. And, and so here I've thrown in an extra sign factor. This is, is, is physically maybe doesn't have good motivations, but in examples that come from differential geometry, which we'll see at some point, it's convenient to include this extra factor. It actually has a very significant influence on the nature and existence of solutions, whether this is positive or negative. But the, the, the basic thing is now we have the Riemann tensor of the metric and we have this curvature type tensor constructed from the key form. And we require that this modified curvature tensor be, be a multiple of the metric tensor. And this I, I think of, I call this couple projective findings. I, I, you could think of other names and maybe another name is better. And I'm happy to hear suggestions in that regard. But you trace this and you get back these, these coupled Einstein equations. And I think it's justified to call them Einstein equations because they can be written as the Einstein field equations with a cosmological constant and, well, the wrong, possibly the wrong sign on the stress energy tensor. And again, via the differential Bianchi identity uh, and these, these are equations, uh, if, if this holds, it implies the constancy of, of this modified scalar curvature. Well, okay, so I have these equations. Do there exist any solutions to these couple of projective flat equations? I don't know in general, but I know, I know a few examples. And um, they come from Kähler manifolds. And they're, the first example uh, is, is uh, well, th they're motivated by this observation of Flaherty and LeBrun. So Flaherty made the observation in the case of scalar curvature zero and LeBrun extended in general. If you have a four-dimensional Kähler manifold, uh, uh, with constant scalar curvature, you take the primitive part of the Ricci form, which is so, which is it, it, this. This I, so this is not well said here. The primitive part of the Ricci form means this, and I'm adding it to the Kähler form. So here's the Kähler form, and and then the Ricci form is is defined from the Ricci tensor in the same way as the Kähler form is defined from the metric. So these are these are skew symmetric. This is skew symmetric two form, which is the Kähler form plus this half of the primitive part of the Ricci form. The observation is that this, together with H, solves the einstein maxwell equations. And this is the Riemannian signature. So it's a nice observation, and LeBrun has a series of very nice articles about this context. And as I say, the original observation in scale flat case goes back to prior. So one can at least give some solutions to this couple projectively flat equation uh, along the same lines. If you have a, a, a a constant homomorphic sectional curvature Taylor manifold. So this is very special. Uh, that's equivalent to, to this equation in my notations where this dot product is exactly this operation here. And, and this is the Kolkata. So these are just the curvature tensors that you can build from the Taylor yeah. form and from the metric. And I think you, you need to use, like, I don't see the cursor when you go back and see this operation here. I think you need to underline that with-, with Here, the... you're saying. Right, yeah, now okay. I- okay. okay, here, I went too quickly. Okay. Thank you. Yes, it's another way to say it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the, so, and, and I mean, it's just direct that what this is saying is that depending on the sign of the, of the sectional curvature, uh, you can, so the sign matters because I have to take this square root. Uh, this pair, so it's, it's not the Kähler form, it's this strange modification of the Kähler form plus H solves these coupled projectively flat equations with one of these signs. And I mean, when I say, are there any other solutions? I mean, I don't have any idea. I haven't actually thought very hard about it, but uh, it's potentially an interesting question. Particularly if there are other solutions, it's maybe less interesting if there aren't, um, of course. But it, it nonetheless shows that the scheme has some sense. Uh, one expects actually this to be quite restrictive. Constant sectional curvature is very restrictive. In a sense, it's nice that the, I, the at least the only solutions I know have something like constant sectional curvature. It's, it's consistent with the general point of view. Einstein should be a whole lot more flexible than constant sectional curvature, projective flatness. So it's not, it's not totally. So here's the general scheme. Um, I want to think about a module of tensors. So 
So that's why I've written SON irreducible. So this could be K forms, it could be trace free symmetric P forms, it could be the trace free form corresponding to some young diagram like this one. Uh, it could be lots of things. Uh, I could make sense of all this for spinners also, but I, I just didn't want to complicate things too much. Um, and I, I need a map um, that, and so MC is the, is the module of, 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 of tensors with curvature symmetry type like that. And so I, I need a bilinear map. A, I want a commutative, a symmetric bilinear map that sends these tensors of this type in, into there. So this is like what I had back here and, or the Kalkani Nomitsu product down here. And, and I'll, I'm gonna normalize it. And here, this normalization is assuming actually that the, the tensors are trace free. It makes sense in that context. But that's usually, that's the case for irreducible tensor models. And so then I'm gonna define a stress energy tensor and it's defined just as before, where R is gonna be some number that depends on the number of rows in, in, these, uh, in, in these diagrams in some way. That, so the, the P forms, you know, it's a, it's a tall diagram for symmetric tensors, it's a, it's a thin diagram like this. So in this case, it would just be plus or minus one, the R, and in this case, it would be plus or minus the number of rows. And in general, it's some dependence like this. And I needed to satisfy an identity like this. And here there's some ambiguities because the generalized gradient means the following. And so if you think of the, in the case of, uh, of, of something like a symmetric three tensor, if I take the covariant derivative, now I'm gonna add a box. And there are two ways I can do that. I can add it at the end, or I can add it like that. And so I have projections of the covariant derivative. So if I have omega and here, I can project d omega here, or I can project d omega here. So call those different projections. And those are, those are what are generalized gradients in this sense. And the star means the metric adjoint. And so when I write the interior multiplication of a vector field in the tensor, there's also an ambiguity here because exactly how in which slot I multiply is gonna depend on exactly which generalized gradient I'm working with. And when I work with tensors with more complicated symmetries, they're going to need various generalized gradients more than there are in this case for the wrong two. In this case, they're going to give rise to Corazzi tensors and killing tensors. Okay. But, but, but at any rate, I have this same identity as I had before, and then I write down the same equations. And they're formally identical to those I had before. All that changes is this term here. And, and, and some of the, the, the coefficients depend on R in some way that's encoded in the stress energy tensor. So otherwise, absolutely. And these are my versions of closed and closed closed. So th these equations make, make good sense in general. Um, and I think in general, one knows very little for different symmetries about the, about the, the, the possibilities. But uh, here is a, an aside comment that, um, that probably is best omitted, but I'll just make it anyway. Um, that you can, some cases, relax the co-closed condition. Um, Maybe rather than describe the general scheme, let's describe an example. This example would be what, what I've done is I've changed the co-close to some condition like this. And for this to make sense, I need some relation between the dimensions of, of, of my manifold and, the, and P. And so these are the kinds of dimensions that make sense for this. And what happens is that if I stick this into this identity here, um, it still turns out that the stress energy tensor is divergence free and these equations uh, continue to make sense. And at least in the 11, in the 411 case, they're well studied and, and, and one of the people in the audience knows far, far, far more about this than I do. Um, and, I, I, and actually it occurred to me to include this slide because I was looking at past editions of these lectures and, and, and saw these equations written in some equivalent, these equations in the middle written in some equivalent form on them. But um, this is just a comment that it's on some relaxations here or, or, or compli com complications of this condition can be considered and still make sense. Um, so here. Um, 
I believe that I should stop uh, in just a minute, but let me at least say the specific context is relevant here. So I want to consider the completely symmetric trace-free tensor. So this corresponds, as I said before, to the, the irreducible module whose symmetries look like that. And we have, as before, the Kalkarni and the Mitsu product and Ritchie trace. The divergence is, 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 is up the signs as this. And then we have the, the two generalized gradients by the Kodazi are given by the Kodazi operator and the killing operator. And, and so the, the, their kernels are what we call killing tensors and Kodazi tensors. So Kodazi tensors are those for which the covariant derivative of the tensor remains completely symmetric and killing tensors are those for which the completely symmetric part is zero. And, and so in a formal sense, the adjoint operators are minus the divergence. And uh, the divergence vanishing actually is a consequence of the vanishing of either of these conditions when you deal with trace-free tensors. So, so there's really not much. The complication I mentioned on the previous slide is impossible in this context. In this case, the, the stress energy tensors look like this. The, the, the difference here comes um, depend, uh, there, there's, there's some logic to why you put the K in in one case and not in the other, but I, I, I don't want to get into it right now. And, and they do satisfy the appropriate identities. So absolutely all, all the general scheme works here and, and you get these, these equations. And um, They look like this. And really the only thing that changes in the two cases is, is, is whether you have this K or not. Um, otherwise, this is where you see a difference manifest itself, which is code of, I mean, it, it's present here in the, in the, in the stress energy tensor. And so let me just give two simple examples that of solutions to these equations um, that actually solve the strongest version. The couple projectively flat case. So these are if I have a, a hypersurface in a space form. So I mean a, a constant curvature manifold. Uh, G can have whatever signature, and it has uh, this curvature. And so the fact that G can have any curve, any signature means I need to suppose the induced metric is really a metric. And I have the second fundamental form with respect to a unimodular orthogonal transversal. And the epsilon here is minus the modulus of this transversal. And that's the epsilon that appears here in these equations. And the gauss kodazi equations tell me exactly well that it, the, 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 the second final form is closed. It's not quite co-closed. And it satisfies this couple projectively flat equation. And so if I have a mean curvature zero non-degenerate hypersurface in a pseudo Riemannian space form, I get a solution of these couple projectively flat equations. The next example is, is, this is for the K equals two case, is for the K equals three case, and it's essentially the same example, but now looking at mean curvature zero non-degenerate Lagrangian submanifolds of para pseudo Kähler manifolds with constant para holomorphic sectional curvature. And the story is exactly the same. Uh, the constant para holomorphic sectional curvature of the ambient manifold means that its curvature tensor looks like this, where C hat is some constant, Epsilon is some sign that depends on whether I'm dealing with a Kähler manifold or a para Kähler manifold. In the Kähler case, it's minus. In the para Kähler case, it's plus. Omega is the Kähler form. And uh, non-degeneracy means that the induced metric is non-degenerate. I have a Lagrangian submanifold. And the second fundamental form is really just twisted. This is actually the second fundamental form. I'm pairing it using the Kähler form, and I get out a symmetric three tensor. The mean curvature one form is its metric trace and the divergence, the co-closed condition is expressed in terms of the differential of, of this respect to the levy Vita connection. In particular, if I have mean curvature zero, I actually get a solution to my couple projective flat equation. This is just to show that there actually exist uh, examples of solutions to these apparently very strong equations and they come from two well-known, interesting differential geometric contexts. And so what I will, so I, as is my tendency, unfortunately, I, uh, I covered less ground than I had intended to in the first talk, but where I will start in the second talk is 
is uh, giving examples of solutions to these equations. I will focus on the Kodazi case, this case, and I will try to give examples that of uh, uh, solutions here and solutions here that don't satisfy the couple projectively flat case. And in the second part of the second talk, I'll specialize to the case k equals three, and 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 begin to relate things with affine differential geometry, which is what in the third talk I will I will uh, develop in, in, in detail as well as, as some of the, some more examples. And um, if you're looking for a real theorem, the real theorem will come in the third talk. But but um, I think that that it's a it's a good moment to stop today and and so it's it's clear also i'll just comment that you know you see here 25 and 109 so that means roughly 30 slides here need to get removed from the uh, next two times um but now i have that that more clear so i but it's now for well past four so i will stop and uh, if there are any questions um i'm ha more than happy to answer them thanks dan your talk. Um, are there any questions? Mm. I have a question. So you have uh, well, several versions of Einstein equations. One is here, but you had also before, right? Um, so the, these Einstein equations, just like from counting perspective, are they overdetermined or Determined just what is their nature? Meaning in this general scheme. Yeah. Well, it's it's essentially, I mean, these these really are the, the usual Einstein field equations for a specific choice of stress energy density. So, I mean, I mean, this is the usual Einstein tensor. This is the these are the Einstein field equation with a cosmological content constant and a particular stress energy tensor. So it, the the same, yeah, I, I have to the same considerations that usually apply apply in, in this context. What what's a little bit complicated is that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that's a that, that doesn't answer your question, but um, so say I'm, I'm not sure I know how to answer your question properly. No, I mean, uh, uh, the standard equations is simultaneously over determined and under determined, right? So, so they gauge gauge freedom. On the other hand, they have Yankee uh, ident Yankee identity divergence free, right? And yeah, so, compensate each other, and they actually like determine nice determined system. So, so, so here, this is divergence free, and this is divergence free by construction. What, what's complicated in general is these equations here may have no solutions at all, right? If you, yeah. think, of, if you think about the case of P-forms, that's Hodge theory. Hodge theory tells you whether these have solutions, okay? If you think about these cases, um, Kodazi tensors and Killing tensors, on surfaces, for instance, one can completely analyze. So basically, Killing tensors exist in, on spheres and thori, the compact case in Riemannian signature, and, and they don't exist on higher genus compact surfaces. Kaudazi tensors is the reverse. They don't exist on spheres, and well, on tori they can exist, but on spheres they don't exist, and they, they're abundant on, on higher genus uh, compact surfaces. And one has, one has vanishing theorems that in, in, in higher dimensions that, that, uh, that, uh, that suggest, I mean, Vanishing theorems don't imply existence theorems, but they suggest that the same dichotomy basically persists in higher dimensions. To say in negative, in Riemannian signature and negative curvature, you expect that there are lots of Kodazi tensors, and in uh, the other way around for Killing tensors, they're not, they tend not to exist in, well, they don't exist in, in, in negative curvature and, and in positive curvature, they can exist. But so the, the, there's a lot hidden in these equations, right? These are in general, you may not have any tensors that satisfy these equations if you're not careful. But, but, but that is property of global, what you say, mm -hmm. uh, that killing doesn't exist or, or, or on uh, surface of higher genus. It's, it's rather global properties, right? It's correct, correct. Locally, yeah, locally you can always like- lo locally, locally, there's no problems yeah. in that sense. Yeah, 
Uh, like, like I was asking about just probably- You're asking about the purely problem. the local, yeah, the local question. So I, I don't, I, I, the truth is I don't uh, know how to answer your question well, because the, the fixing the form of this tensor breaks the, the gauge freedom, so to speak, right? I'm not a physicist. I don't think like a physicist. So, so it's hard for me to, I, I, there's, a, I'll try to, I'll tell you what, I'll try to think of a good answer to your question for next week, because it has a good answer. I'm just, I have to think about it. Yeah. Before you mention uh, uh, that this general scheme can also be applied to spinors, but uh, that will overcomplicate uh, today's discussion, but can you say a few, a few words well, on which right. kind of uh, equations uh, you get? In that case? Well, I, what I mean, I, what I mean is that here, here, really, what I'm starting with is is just a. I could start with a spinner module here instead of a instead of a tensor module. Okay, and and I, look, one has to analyze whether this kind of data even exists, right? Hmm. Okay, and, and it does in general, at least, and but. I have only analyzed in any detail the P form case and the, the, the these two cases, these two super simple cases somehow, right? And maybe in this case I know something, but 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 in general there's a lot to do here still, right? In terms of just working, it's just a question of working out representation theoretic things. How much freedom do you have in the choice of this map? And but at any rate, the, the whole setup should should. There's nothing here really that depends on having a tensor module rather than a spinner module. Spinner module. I just have to have a spin structure to make sense of spinner modules. But, but so beyond, have you have you some examples in this case? I haven't thought about it at all. No, is oh, the, okay. the correct okay. answer. I, I think. Oh, okay. I think. But I, I think what what I mean is uh, it should it, the same scheme should work just fine in terms of the setup later. Finding examples is where all the interesting part is. And, and yeah, that's a whole other matter. No, the, the only part where I have any, the, only, the part where I have any, where I'm able to say anything serious about examples is this case, is, the, is this case. Okay. And, and maybe I can say something in this case. Yeah. No, no, and, and I, but um, I mention it because it, it should it should actually contact with things that are studied already. Yeah. I, as I say, I'm not a I'm not a physicist, and so I'm throwing some things out there in the hopes that people that know more than I do uh, may see something that, that reminds them of something interesting more than yeah. So, I don't okay. know if that's a I, I don't know if that's an effect or a good answer or not. But. No, okay. I was uh, just, just curious okay. if uh, right. if this yeah. was was carried out uh, or not. Yeah. No, no. no. Okay. It, it's carried out in the sense of it, it's not written up carefully. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but Andrea, do you mean actually like uh, supergravity equations? Uh, like with no, this? No, I, I don't know. That's what I was asking. <laughs> since yeah. This, yeah. Since this general scheme up. No, I mean, I mean here, 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 here in this in this sense, for and there are other things. I mean, one. Here no, are, no, 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 yeah. but these are these are equations. No, no, I, I meant with the with the spinner model. With spinners, so, yeah. So some kind of killing spinners or whatever uh, kind of a modified equation. I was just curious what uh, comes out of the uh, general scheme. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, okay, these generalized gradients. I mean, this is completely analyzed. Um, the by Branson. And then there's a there's a paper of there's a paper of Calder Bank, uh, and Hertzlik. And they and, and there's a survey paper by Hertzlik also. These papers they they basically completely analyze. So the the the, the antecedent to this is what are people call Stein Weiss operators. And so, you know, the other other words here that probably matter are Rita Schwinger, right? And um, they, they analyze completely what are all these grid generalized gradients and so forth. And, and so that, that machinery is completely developed. It's just a question in, 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 the, in the spinner generality for any 
any spin modules. And and so so the, the only part of this that really has and and likewise um, yeah, the the part of this that hasn't been just you know systematically written out is is this part. You know this map. What are these maps? When do they exist? What are they? Right in all the possible cases, and and exactly you know it, it, what's the right number to put here. But but it's it's a question of someone with the patience to go through all the representation no, theory, sure. sitting down and doing it, and that person may not be me. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about this thing you said on every. Uh, um, hypersurface, there is uh, two projective structures, one of which is flat uh, via this uh, yes. south map. And, and what happens if to these, uh, maybe you said it, what happens to this other non-flat projective structure if it's affine sphere? Is it? Uh, no, the affine sphere is actually exactly the case where they're both projectively flat. Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, you said, okay, okay that's, a, that's an equivalent. It turns out that's an equivalent statement. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that slide comes later. All right. Uh, it's somewhere down here. Okay, okay. There, there's that slide. <laughs> I, 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 but, but I, um, next, next session. Yeah. 